the issue of racism in America is thought by many people to be the, the major dynamic in terms of the relationships of whites to whites, the relationships of blacks to whites, and the relationships of blacks to blacks. We've had some very interesting theories, uh, principally those advanced by white scientists and white social scientists, namely Jensen and Shockley, both of whom have indicated that blacks might be innately inferior. We have a very interesting theory that is just surfaced from one of the leading black psychiatrists. And tonight we're going to discuss a theory called color confrontation. And the author and proponent and creator of that theory is Dr. Francis Welsing. Dr. Welsing, uh, basically, as a psychiatrist, how does your theory of color confrontation differ with Freudian psychoanalytic theory? Well, Freud, um, I think, spent most of his creative years looking at behavior from the standpoint that behavior was motivated by the repression of the sexual instinct uh, and the evolution of the sexual instinct. And contrary to, and that means looking within the individual to understand why behavior is such as it is. Uh, the color confrontation thesis really looks at the total social dynamic to begin to understand uh, patterns of behavior. And not only that, it looks at very specifically, it's an attempt to understand the behavior patterns of whites. Uh, we as black behavioral scientists and as a black and non-white population have been studied in terms of white investigators looking at our patterns of behavior and writing about that and building theories about black patterns of behavior. Uh, but we have not really spent very much time looking from looking at white patterns of behavior either be, by black behavioral scientists or white behavioral scientists. So I am attempting to understand the behavioral patterns on the part of whites. You're saying something to the effect that there's not a black problem, there's a white problem. Well, we were told back in 1968 that the Kerner Commission said that was the Presidential Commission on Violence that uh, racism was the number one cause of violence. And in 1969, for example, the black psychiatrists within the American Psychiatric Association uh, said to the American Psychiatric Association that we thought that racism was the number one cause of mental health problems in this area of the world. And we wanted the National Institutes of Mental Health to study racism. On the contrary, they decided no, they would not study racism, meaning the behavior patterns of whites, but that they would set up a special institute to study minority groups. Have you done any kind of psychiatric study in, in that area? Well, um, I'll tell you about uh, color confrontation theory and how it evolved. I encountered an idea. A gentleman had written about racism not as individual prejudice or institutional practices, but as a worldwide system of white supremacy domination. In other words, that was his definition, that it was behavioral practices carried out by people who classify themselves as white, not only in the area of the world that we call the United States or in so-called South Africa, but all over the entire world. He said that this is a behavioral system that seeks to maintain itself. And I raise the question, I guess psychiatrists always raise the question as to why. Why, if such and such a pattern of behavior is as it is, why is it so? And I raise that question in my own mind. Why would whites seek to establish a system of white supremacy all over the world, oppressing and subordinating people who have the capacity to produce color? And what I came up with is this, that uh, let me see how I'll begin, that if people go around talking, if anyone goes around talking about I am superior to everyone, then the psychiatrist or the behavioral scientist in questioning in their own mind, why is this individual saying this? Many times we come up with the fact that the individual is feeling inferior or inadequate. Do you see? And they are compensating by trying to make people believe that they are superior. So when we hear people saying that white is superior, white is superior, white is superior, uh, then I raise the question in my mind, well, let's look first of all at what white represents. And when we look at white uh, skin, from the point of view of the biologist or the geneticist, we see that the inability to produce color 
the inability to produce melanin pigment, which is responsible for all skin coloration, that not being able to produce this color is actually a genetic deficiency state and it is a form of albinism. All right, but it has never been looked at in this way within the context of the white supremacy culture, but it nonetheless is this. Uh, so that I said in that paper that apparently white people having this genetic deficiency state and also being existing in the world in very small numbers uh, relative to the people who have the capacity to produce color. For example, white people represent about one-tenth of the world's population people who have the capacity to produce color, black, brown, red, and yellow people so-called, uh, represent nine-tenths of the total world population. So that when whites, I say, when they moved out of Europe, circled around the globe and found out, wow, well there are very few people like ourselves who have this inability to produce color. And they had a psychological reaction to number one, the fact that they were a numerical minority, and number two, on the basis that they did not have the capacity to produce color, as the vast majority of the people in the world did. And they felt color deficient, numerically deficient and color deficient. Now, one way that they could psychologically compensate for this sense of genetic inadequacy and numerical deficiency would be to say, well, I really don't like the fact that I can't produce color, but if I can make the people who have color believe that they're the ugly people and feel that they are degraded, then I can feel good. All right, well, let me ask this question. Mm -hmm. Now, I think in your book, you touch upon functional supremacy. Right. That is, uh, white people can show that they do control everything. They have the power. Mm -hmm. They define the values. They, mm -hmm. uh, they give permission if they want etc. and so forth. Mm -hmm. In essence, they do have a superior status. Mm -hmm. And let me ask this question. Perhaps, or is it possible, and I'm being the devil's advocate, I want to make that Fine. clear. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that because they do maintain power over non-whites everywhere, mm -hmm. that they basically may be genetically superior? Well, I would say that, you know, that's always a possibility. Uh, but I look at it in this way, that uh, we never go around talking about dogs being inferior to people. I mean, nobody ever bothers to say that. Why? Because dogs cannot open their <laughs> dog food. We have to do that for them. We have to, you know, provide houses for them and that kind of thing. Now, if indeed one group of people were indeed inferior to another group, there would be no need to put them in inferior housing, put them in inferior schools, you could give them the very best schools and the very best housing and they still would show up inferior. For example, we believe that there are some children who are mentally retarded, right? And what do we do? We try to provide the very best kinds of compensatory education for these children so they can perform at their maximal level. Do you see? And many of the institutions that are for mentally retarded children, special schools, are far superior to the schools that non-white children are given, you see, to develop in. So I say that, right, people do a lot, give a lot of lip service to the fact that non-white people and black people are genetically inferior, but I don't really believe that they believe that. Do you see what I'm saying? Because if they indeed believed, there wouldn't be any need to keep people in ghettos or on reservations. All right, well, or, do you, then, are you saying that there is some type of, you're, you're saying that there's not just a, an American racism or European racism, you're saying that there's a worldwide racism based on white supremacy. People who classify themselves all over the world relate to people who have the capacity to produce color in a way, in other words, white has to be functionally superior to non-whites and there are all kinds of maneuvers in all areas of activity engaged in to keep this power relationship such as it is. For example, we can t talk about people behavior being categorized in nine areas, economics, education, entertainment, labor law, politics, religion, sex, and war. And we see people who classify themselves as white moving in certain very specific ways in all of these areas of activity to keep the color relationship such as it well, is. Then, is there some conspiracy that a, a, a super group of whites are actually sitting down logically computerizing and organizing and, and, and ministering? to keep this white supremacy intact? Well, I don't like to talk about it as a conspiracy. I see it as a behavioral system that was evolved as a psychological defense. Now, there are many white people who really don't understand what's going on. 
they put in behavioral units to the maintaining white supremacy as a system. But if you ask them, well, why are you doing this? They say, well, I don't know. You say, well, okay, isn't it wrong to discriminate against people of color? Yes, that is wrong and that should change. But functionally over time, the behavioral units that they contribute do not allow for the system to really alter well, like what itself. Would be but I don't want to call it a conspiracy because that sounds like cloak and dagger well, and that be, kind what, of thing. What would be an example of, uh, of, of, a, of a white person participating in one of these nine areas that you specified, but being unaware that they were involved in this unconscious hatred of blacks? All right, well, let's look at this. Um, I think right now, or more or less recently, uh, I'm trying to really think of an example that uh, is good. Uh, we see many white people moving to adopt black and other non-white children because these children are said not to have adequate homes or the uh, institutions that are established to take care of these children are inadequate. All right, well, on the surface, uh, the white person says, well, I feel sorry for these children. I want to help these children. All right. But to really help these children would mean, uh, from my perspective, to provide the fathers with adequate job opportunities, to provide both parents with adequate educational opportunities, housing opportunities, opportunities for health. Um, in other words, e equal social economic opportunities. All right. But to do that would destroy the system of white supremacy. You see, so that the behavior at one level looks as though the person is be functioning in a so-called good moral way. But underlying that are some more fundamental or more basic patterns of behavior where the same individual might say, well, uh, I don't want my neighborhood destroyed, you know, by it being integrated. Mm -hmm. Or I don't want busing or um, the father in such a situation might become disturbed on his job if a black or non-white man is promoted above him so you or his salary is greater. So you're saying these are ego defense mechanisms? Right, so that, right, but these are defense mechanisms. In other words, the whole worldwide structure where white is superior to non-white in all of these nine areas, I say is maintained to help whites compensate for a sense of genetic inadequacy. I don't know. But I, I think at the bottom yes. of, of some, some things you, you say explicitly and not so explicitly, particularly in a quote you have here uh, to one of your bibliographies, you, you say that at the bottom of it all, that whites hate blacks. Now, everything else is, is simply an extension or a defense well, that's maneuver a quote, against that's that. That's a quote from uh, the gentleman that I spoke about, Neely Fuller, who in writing a book that he calls a textbook for victims of white supremacy, uh, he said white people hate black people, not because black people are black, but white people hate black people because they themselves are not black, you see. But I don't really, myself, I don't really deal in the question of hate yes, because I, I love and hate are very confusing well, the, the, terms. Uh, right, but, but I think Fuller is saying essentially. Right, well, I, I, mm -hmm. I was saying that to lay the groundwork to say what I'll say now, and that is, Whites are going to say that your theory is simply a black racist theory. I'm sure you, you know that. I mean, th they're going to say that, that the fact that you have created your theory is because mm -hmm. you began from a subjective position of hating whites and then went about the business of creating the theory. As Fuller is saying, mm -hmm. that because whites hate blacks, not because they hate blacks, but because they themselves don't have color. Now, how, how do you handle? This, and I know you know this is, is, is present. Well, that present. might, right. This charge that you right. are simply developing a theory that is a black racist theory. Well, that might be a response uh, on the parts of whites because all the responses will be to try to write, keep the balance going so that the person feels psychologically comfortable. I am not advocating at all that non white people move to a position to hate white people at all. I'm simply really trying to take the position of a scientist to say, let us understand a behavioral mm -hmm. phenomena. And if this is at the base of the behavior, then it is best that people who classify themselves as white and people who classify themselves as non-white understand this. Do You see, because mm -hmm. there are many white people who say that they want to do something about racism, but they don't really know what to do because they really don't understand the phenomena. Mm -hmm. And so I say, if you understand the phenomena and you really sincerely want to do something about it, then you can change it. It's in the same way that if a doctor or a scientist says, well, I want to uh, provide the cure for cancer, I want to look for the cure for cancer, well, first he has to understand how does that cancer cell function mm -hmm. and then develop a cure based on the particular physiologic or cellular dynamics 
of that particular cell that is causing that particular problem. So that I'm not saying, you know, hate white people at all. I'm saying, well, let's try to understand this behavioral phenomena that has a massive impact on the massive majority of the people in the world. Now, one of the things I want to go back to that uh, you haven't asked about was what is some of the evidence that we have to support the thesis that white people really don't like being white, but that they wish that they had color. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I look at and uh, uh, address myself to in the paper is that even though whites have programmed non-white people and also programmed themselves to believe that if you have color that this is really means that you're inferior and that this is degraded and that this is ugly, that white people suntan. You see, and sun, the sun tanning mechanism itself is a phenomenon that is seen all over the world in people who lack the capacity to produce skin color. And what they are actually doing is exposing themselves to the sun and to the ultraviolet rays of the sun so that the ultraviolet rays will stimulate cells that are called melanocytes to produce small quantities of melanin if they're capable of producing any melanin at all. And that's the very pigment that they are using the ultraviolet rays to stimulate that people who are classified as non-white already have. Like black people have the greatest capacity to produce melanin, so-called brown and then so-called red, then so-called yellow people. And white people have very little, if any, at all capacity to produce melanin. Also, the makeup industry is a really massive industry, you know, all over the so-called Western world where people are adding color to colorless skins or stockings, you know, that have various hues are adding color. And I think that some of the attention within the whole of the white supremacy culture, some of the attention that they pay to hair color can be seen as significant because that is the only area of the body that really has quantities of melanin pigment. Melanin pigment is also responsible for hair color. Now, white this, people get this, very excited about Is this why they say blondes have more fun? Well, Would that I be a reaction no, formation? No. I think that that's a reaction formation. Uh, I had an interesting discussion one time where I was saying that uh, apparently based on the behavior of whites that one can say well white people really don't like being white and there was a white woman in the audience and she said well she heard on television that blondes had more fun and I said well if you you know if you look in some areas of the community where black and white people are living together you see the number of white men let us say who are looking for white black women that is to have sexual relationships I wonder whether the blondes are having any fun uh, because there is a sexual attraction on the part of whites for non-whites. Now, whites have turned it around, and they have said that non-white people, and in particular, black people are sexually attracted to them, and the white man has gone into a historically right, hysterical in that same, in that same context, reaction. In that same context, because I want to I make sure that this hate situation is thoroughly understood. Whites, to a very great extent, say that blacks hate them. Right. Now, how do you interpret this phenomenon? Well, whites are projecting. They are projecting their own feelings. Uh, it's the same way that whites many times say that they are afraid of blacks and afraid of other non-whites. But white people have all of the guns. They have all of the armaments in the world. So it really is non-white people who should be afraid of white people. And historically, at least in terms of, uh, of what we know in the history of the white supremacy culture, the aggressive and the violence and the physically destructive activity has come from whites to non-whites. Mm -hmm. But whites turn it around and say, you hate us and this is why we're doing what all right, we now, do. If, right. if, if all blacks magically understand your theory and if all blacks begin to say, my problem is not a black problem, my problem is a white problem, stemming from the very... Uh, from the dynamic of white the supremacy. The dynamic of white supremacy mm -hmm. being uh, a worldwide re relationship. What would this do if blacks understood, if, assuming your theory is correct, what would this do for blacks? Well, I think that one of the major things that has happened to blacks and other non-white people within the context of the white supremacy culture is that uh, people of color have been ashamed of their color. And this has profound uh, impact on the development of ego or the development of a uh, positive concept of self. You see that even we right now, in spite of all of the discussion about black is beautiful, we still see young black children who say, I don't want to be black. 
You see, because they spend a lot of time looking at television or they look at the magazines or they look at the books that they're given in school and they see presented in all of these forms of material uh, white children or white figures and so the child says well I don't look like that and, the, and since I'm not there then something must be wrong with my image. I say that if uh, the entire non-white community not only in this area of the world but all over the world if we begin to understand the the fundamental question about color and the fundamental question about genetics then we will understand why white people are behaving in the way that they do and once you understand this, you can hear any number of times that uh, white is superior radiating from the um, uh, power within the white supremacy culture through its media and whatnot. But you'll simply say, well, I understand why they have to present mm -hmm. themselves in this way. We will also understand uh, the three-point focus, what I call the three-point focus within the white supremacy culture. Uh, the white supremacy culture always focuses on color, genetics, and sex, and sex and genetics and color. And we've recently heard about Jensen and Shockley talking about black people are genetically inferior. Well, if we understand that, number one, white is a genetic deficiency state. It is a recessive genetic trait that is dominated by any capacity to produce color then we will understand why the drive to say that somebody else is genetically inferior, where in reality it is the white position that is genetically deficient, do you see? Or why the hysterical focus on sickle cell anemia, blacks have a killer genetic trait, whereas in reality whites have many, many more genetic diseases than black and other non-white people. Do you see what I'm so saying? So you're saying to Jensen and Shockley then, you're saying that their theory is basically a theory of self-hate, the, hatred well, of themselves. Well, I say, all right, I say that racism, the phenomena, the behavioral phenomena of white supremacy, really started because of self-alienation. Do you see where white people really did not like the way they looked? Okay, and then they projected that alienation, you know, so now it has evolved, it started out as an alienation towards self, and it has evolved to a very high form of alienation towards other people. All right, well, why didn't Freud, who is uh, allegedly the father of uh, psychoanalysis and the psychoanalytic theory, why didn't Freud deal with color and this relationship to uh, mental illness and pathology and so Well, I have a theory about that. The way that I look at it is this, is that Freud focused on sexual repression as the cause of personality pattern formation. And I say that the major, the dominant experience that Freud had, Freud was a Jew in Austria, all right? His family and his ancestors before that were being discriminated against because they were Jews, you know, and we recently went through the Second World War and the whole uh, horrible phenomena of anti-Semitism and the destruction of six million Jews. All right, if we understand, first of all, people who are of the Jewish religion are called Semites, all right? They're people who evolved so-called in the Middle East. If we look at that term, Semite, now if you look at Webster, Webster says Semite is an uh, individual who speaks a Semitic language. Well, I think that's a deficient definition. The Latin prefix semi means half. People in the Middle East are half black and half white. And most of them are called non-whites. Now the group that went into Europe, because of intermarriage, lost a significant amount of the melanin producing capacity that they had but they went there as people of color. And I say that the whole phenomenon of anti-Semitism is fundamentally a color question. Now, I say that Freud experienced anti-Semitic uh, repression and oppression as a Jew, so-called, within a particular area of the world. But having some awareness, if I start talking about this, then maybe the, the pressure, the overt pressure on me, you know, maybe he didn't think about it consciously, you see. He didn't talk about the oppression or the repression or that he felt as a Jew. He, he internalized it or talked about sexual repression instead. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Uh, I say that Freud eventually was chased out of Austria by the Nazis. He probably would have been chased out, you know, some 20 years before had he started talking about anti-Semitism is the cause of personality pattern formation. You see, or the need to be an anti-Semite is the really major uh, core or motivating factor in terms of producing personality in the anti-Semite 
as well as producing behavior pattern formation in the person who is a victim of that system. So of you oppression. see a parallel in the in the genesis of, of why right. Jews and blacks are oppressed. In right, because many people used to say that Jews were the niggers of Europe. Do you see? But now you have Jews who say, well, we're white. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? And who, within the state of Israel itself, carry out color discrimination. You see, even within the group of people who say that they are all of the same religious faith. That you have a group of people who now have lost the capacity, you know, to produce melanin. Then saying, well, we're white. And then carrying out the reaction mm -hmm. on people who are less you know, who have more of the capacity to produce color. We have In the a, same way. We have a short time, and I would oh, like, okay. before we finish, for you to give us uh, the benefit of any further research you're working on. Is there any specific research that you're... Well, I am preparing a paper uh, to deliver to the National Medical Association annual meeting um, in August, it will be in New York, uh, to the section on psychiatry and neurology. And I'm a presenting a paper that is called Counter-Racist Psychiatry. And it's a new theory of psychiatry or a new set of premises in psychiatry that deal with the fact that behavior as we see it in blacks and other non-whites, but I'm dealing specifically with I the black to group. You. Oh. I really would like to get into it. <laughs> we'll have out to do of time. it again. I'd like to thank you very, very much okay. for being on Black Journal. Okay. Uh, this has been a conversation with Dr. Francis Welsing, a leading black psychiatrist and a person with, I think, a very unusual theory on color confrontation. That was, uh, was very... Uh,